Um, all right, I guess uh, it's about 10, so let's get started. So thank you all for coming. Um, I do have to apologize. I know, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm going to be able to put on as good a show as Judge Napolitano would, um, but hopefully at least I can tell you something interesting about uh, what I think is one of the more intriguing problems in applied economics or applied Austrian economics, and that is the economics of war and of war making. So um, this is actually a theme that has been studied repeatedly in Austrian economics over the years. Um, going back, uh, particularly uh, people like Mises and Lionel Robbins were very interested in it. Um, but it's also not one of those topics um, that you see discussed uh, very often in uh, sort of uh, conventional surveys of, of Austrian contributions to economics. But Austrians have been interested in this topic for, for a very long time. And so a little, I'm going to show a little bit of that to you um, as we go through this, uh, this lecture today. Um, what I'm mainly going to be talking about um, is trying to, to, uh, to give you a sort of um, um, survey of some distinctly Austrian insights into the economics of war, right? Um, because as I hope to show, um, Austrians do have some unique uh, ways of looking at this problem and some unique ways of answering questions about things like uh, what wars are, um, what makes wars possible, the economic causes of war, um, how wars are prosecuted, and hopefully something about how wars uh, end uh, and maybe could be prevented in the future. Um, so there's a lot of uh, uh, Austrian writings on this topic, as I said, um, and I hope to, to get through those in the next few minutes. Um, another thing I, I do have to sort of uh, maybe apologize for is that um, uh, I am uh, taking the, the most recent iteration of this lecture. In previous years, uh, versions of this talk had been given by people like the late Ralph Rako uh, and Robert Higgs, um, who are just terrific scholars and were real masters of this subject. Um, instead of trying to do a sort of a poor imitation of their work, I'm hoping to take a slightly different tack um, and talk about things uh, about the ideas of Mises and, uh, and many of his students um, who had written on these subjects. Um, so hopefully what I have to say will complement um, their works um, and their talks um, they had given at previous Mises universities. And if this is something that interests you, I, I really highly commend um, their, uh, both their writings and their lectures to you because they're, they're really fascinating and, uh, and wonderful. Um, in any case, uh, I'm sticking mainly to the economics, though, and so I'm not going to talk on, uh, about some of the um, themes that, that others have focused on in the past, things like the relationship of war with uh, civil liberties. Um, this is obviously a very important topic, but it's, it's uh, outside the scope of what I'm going to be discussing here. Um, so I want to begin by saying a little something about um, how this topic fits within this broader framework of Austrian economics. And uh, to do that, I want to draw your attention to this comment from Mises. Uh, this is from Human Action, but you can find many similar comments throughout his works. And Mises says that economics, at least until now, has been the best developed branch of praxeology. Right? So you've already, uh, you're have already familiar through your readings and through earlier lectures in this week with the idea of praxeology and with this Austrian interest in putting action at the center of economics and of social science. But uh, when Mises puts it like this, uh, he's raising a very, I think, an interesting question, which is, okay, so sure, economics is the best developed branch of praxeology, um, but what are the other branches, right? What, what do those look like exactly? What goes into them, right? Um, sometimes people use economics and praxeology sort of interchangeably, um, but they're not interchangeable, right? Economics is just one part um, of this broader method of approaching social science questions, right? Um, so what else uh, might be included um, within this broad framework? And here's one um, suggested schema um, from an old uh, Rothbard article in the American Economic Review. And um, right away you can see that from some of these things that what Mises says is correct. It does seem like this uh, part B, um, the economic part, the specifically economic part of praxeology, this is the, most, uh, the best developed, right? It has the most sort of fields and subfields, and we have a good idea of what goes in there. But then there are also um, some of these other uh, categories um, that Rothbard suggests, including the theory of war, right? uh, the theory of hostile action. So in addition um, to being a part of uh, economic analysis, applied economic analysis, um, the study of war is also an independent type of investigation um, that we can do um, by thinking through the implications of, of action um, and social cooperation and conflict and so on. Right? Um, note that for uh, Mises' main interest um, was in the first type um, of, of studying war. Uh, if you look at human action, for instance, Mises has a chapter on the economics of war, and, and that is uh, in the last part of the book, the part that deals with interventionism, right, the hampered market economy. 
right? And of course, you can see why that would be, you know, why this uh, sort of large scale violence um, that's usually uh, uh, prosecuted by states, why, how that would relate to, um, uh, to more conventional economic interventionism, right? So in any case, there are at least two ways that you can think about um, how this, uh, how warfare fits within a broader framework of Austrian economics, and I'm going to hope to to draw on uh, a little bit of both of those um, as we go through this. So um, the first big question is, what is war? Um, how do we define it from an economic perspective? And war is not, uh, unlike some other concepts, it's not uh, a narrow praxeological concept. It's, right, the, the idea of war isn't written into the idea of action. Right? Um, instead, it's something more anthropological or historical. Um, that is, we observe these types of conflicts in the real world, and we try to categorize them, uh, you know, come up with common characteristics um, that we could use to identify them. And that's how we get our sort of broad historical understanding of what warfare is. Um, and that's where, we're gonna be, uh, where I'm going to be starting uh, today. Um, and in this view, um, we could come up with at least three important characteristics uh, of, uh, of warfare in the modern era. First, war is purposeful. Right? This is why it fits within a framework of action, by the way, because that's what action is. It's purposeful behavior. Right? But it's important to recognize purpose behind war because historically, uh, many wars were treated as inevitable um, or as somehow outside the realm of human choice. Right. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes this was for uh, for devious purposes. Um, other times, it was simply mistaken ideologies. Right. Um, for instance, you know, an ideology of class conflict that asserts that uh, you know modern wars are just the logic of the capitalist system or of imperialism playing themselves out, um, and therefore are, are to some extent inevitable and can't really be controlled. Um, these would deny the purposeful element in war making. All right. And these are provide one good reason um, why we need to take note of this. Um, second, warfare is organized, right? Wars take place over a period of time, sometimes many, many years, and they require an enormous amount of resources uh, in, order to, uh, in order to prosecute, right? And what this means is that there has to be some kind of organizing agency that's responsible for planning and allocating uh, the use of scarce resources, right? Um, this, by the way, is going to hint a little bit at uh, some socialist calculation problem, which maybe I'll mention a little bit more in a minute. Um, but the, the basic point is that somebody needs to be doing the wartime planning, right? Um, however troublesome or inefficient or uh, irrational it might be, um, somebody is going to have to be uh, doing this, right? And that hints then at the, the third uh, characteristic of modern warfare, which is that it involves at least one state. Now, an important point to make is that uh, warfare is not unique to states, right? Um, it existed before, uh, you know, long before uh, states did, and presumably will exist in some form long after the last state becomes dust, right? Um, so it, it's not going away anytime soon. But nevertheless, uh, war, uh, states do have a very sort of special relationship um, with warfare. Right? And the reason is that uh, be, this massive this purpose and this massive organization and allocation of resources, human and physical, this requires something like a state. Right? It requires an extremely powerful agency um, to do all this organizing and planning, um, usually uh, without the permission uh, of many of the people who are being planned and organized. Right? So uh, it's very difficult to get anything uh, like this, especially on a large scale going, without some kind of agency that looks something like a modern state. Right? Um, and if you look at works in um, sociology and works on sort of the origin of the modern states, you can see this special relationship uh, between states uh, and, and war making. Um, you, know, you have sociologists like Charles Tilley, for example, who argue that uh, warfare is actually the reason for the creation of the modern state. Um, because for, uh, you know, for millennia, practically, uh, rulers have been looking for ways to finance these extraordinarily expensive military adventures. And it is very difficult to do that unless you have, for instance, uh, a strong, dependable tax base. Right? So people like Tilly argue that the modern state emerged as a, as a way um, for rulers to finance military expenditures right? by creating this geographical political area um, that they could then systematically tax over time and, and develop a, a more consistent stream of revenue. Okay? Um, 
Carl von Clausewitz, who uh, is a name that uh, you might be familiar with, famously said that uh, war is the continuation of politics by other means. And that's what he's kind of getting at with this. Um, again, this sort of special relationship um, between states and war making. Again, this has been known since ancient times. In fact, some of the ancients put it even better. Um, I think this sums it up really nicely. Uh, war is the greatest affair of state, the basis of life and death, the doubt of survival or extinction, right? This is the logic of states and warfare, right? Warfare is always the last resort of any state uh, when it comes either to defense uh, or for the expansion um, of its own political power, right? So moving on um, to talking about the economic causes of war, um, of course, each individual historical war has its own particular causes, right? Um, but we can is, you know, create some groupings and some classifications and different types uh, of cause of war. Um, and among these are economic ones, right? And so, of course, naturally, this is the type that people like Mises tended to focus most on. And for Mises, when thinking about the cause of, of international conflict, the basic question uh, was economic and it was ideological. Right? Um, economically speaking, uh, the major choice that states are, are always having to make is between uh, what Mises called autarky um, or the international division of labor. Right? Autarky is economic self-sufficiency. Um, it is... Um, in a sense, um, the, pol uh, the policy of mercantilism, um, of economic nationalism, um, a policy of anti-free trade, uh, essentially, right? Um, and uh, uh, policies that are particularly opposed to the free movement of capital and labor, okay? So um, these types of, idea of, of, of policies and the ideologies behind them um, are for Mises uh, not only deeply illiberal, um, but also opposed to economic common sense. Right? Um, because autarky is a recipe essentially for poverty, um, whereas the international division of labor and embracing a, a global free market economy is the only reliable path um, to prosperity and also the only reliable path to peace. Right? And I'm sure you can see how the logic of this plays out. When you have domestic protectionist policies that are designed to protect domestic producers at the expense of everyone else in the world, particularly uh, foreign producers, um, it's only natural that this would create tensions and conflicts in the political realm that could grow and eventually boil over and become actual military conflicts, right? Um, protectionist policies, uh, you know, promote the prosperity of a small number of privileged groups at home um, while directly damaging the po uh, prosperity um, of, other, of many other groups abroad, right? So for example, you can understand why if you were you know, a, a poverty-stricken consumer in a foreign country, uh, unable to make a living because you can't sell your goods across borders, uh, why that would gradually turn into you know, uh, a great deal of uh, political dislike um, and eventually tension and, uh, and, and outright military conflict, right? So for Mises, this is the, the central economic question, right? It's not a question of sort of broader class interests or something like that. Um, it's really about um, economic privilege and the people who have it um, and the conflicts with the people who don't. Right? Um, this is a very uh, nice quote from Mises on this topic when he says that economic nationalism, necessary complement of domestic interventionism, hurts the interests of foreign peoples and thus creates international conflict. Uh, it does this through customs, migration barriers, foreign exchange controls, quantitative trade restrictions, and expropriation of foreign investments, right? In other words, the myriad of different types uh, of price and other economic controls that states have at their disposal, um, all of these uh, go into creating uh, a massive uh, uh, potential for global conflict, right? So this, is, for me, this is what's behind um, the economic causes of war. Now, um, once a war does break out, uh, it sets in motion a chain of economic events um, that uh, not only have a, a disastrous effect on the economy, but that create a whole uh, range of problems um, that governments have to try to solve, right? About how they allocate resources and about how uh, they continue the conflict and eventually try to uh, win it, right? With win in quotation marks. Right? Um, so this gets us to the problem of war finance, right? And once again, as I said, this is an ancient problem. It goes back uh, millennia. But essentially, um, any government, whether in peacetime or wartime, has essentially three options um, for financing any particular venture, right? And those options are taxation, borrowing, and inflation, right? And each of these plays an important part in 
uh, the logic of war making and in the logic of war finance. And as you see, there's a sort of um, logic to the way um, that governments change their attitudes towards each of these methods as a conflict goes on. So typically, um, governments in peacetime and wartime um, start with taxation, right? Again, this is one of the, those fundamental characteristics of modern states. So it's no surprise that governments resort to them very quickly uh, when they need uh, some quick cash, right? And you will see, uh, you know, if you look at uh, wars in the last century or so, particularly major wars, uh, when they break out, they are shortly followed by significant changes in taxes, right? Um, whether it's um, a question of who's being taxed or a question of increasing particular tax rates, um, governments use both, right? Um, the trouble with taxation that governments always face is that it is extremely unpopular, right? Um, despite all the, uh, you know, the, the jingoistic patriotic rhetoric that you might hear around the outbreak of wars, once people actually have to start paying money themselves, uh, they get a lot more skeptical um, about the value of the war effort, right? Um, and the reason for this is simple, right? Uh, people, other things equal, prefer to keep their money, right? And um, if people notice very quickly once their tax rates increase, right? Once you, you know, you, it's very easy to see um, if your you know, income tax rates suddenly double um, that you have less cash in your pocket to spend, right? And as a result, your standards of living are going to fall, right? So taxation is, is, tends to be uh, quite unpopular. So even though governments resort to it very quickly and sometimes even uh, uh, invoke um, extreme increases in taxation during wartime, there are some pretty hard limits um, to what any particular population is going to accept um, in terms of taxation, right? Um, so this is a big problem um, that uh, that governments are always facing, right? Um, by the way, the, just as a side note, I don't know if you know this, but this is why the withholding tax was introduced in 1943 um, in the middle of World War II. Um, governments needed to get around this, this taxation problem, and um, they, they had sort of tried out the withholding tax in some, some earlier context, but it wasn't very widely used. Um, but then in World War II, they needed to find a way to increase tax rates, um, but they needed to get past this problem that people um, you know, at that time were uh, mainly paying their taxes in like little installments throughout the year. So when the tax bill came due, like any other bill, you had to have actually saved the money and you had to be prepared to fork it over, right? Um, so that's what people were used to, um, and to get around that um, and around the very obvious increases in taxation, uh, the withholding tax was introduced because once tax withholding happens, uh, you never get the money to begin with, right? It's deducted from your paycheck before you ever see it, and so it sort of feels like it's not really your money and that you never really owned it, so you don't feel the loss of it as much, right? And that actually produces, that has a, a profound psychological effect because it means that people are willing to accept much higher tax rates um, than they normally normally would if you first handed them a pile of cash and then said, oh yeah, by the way, now I'm going to take 50% of it back or whatever, right? Um, another important implication of that is that you'll notice that the withholding tax did not go away after the war was ended, right? You know, it's, it's still with us today um, and in fact is still used in, uh, in most developed countries in some form or other, right? Um, this gets at what's uh, sometimes called the ratchet effect. Um, uh, of government intervention, which I'll talk about more as we go, right? Um, anyway, eventually taxation just isn't enough, so governments need to find another way uh, to finance the war, right? So very quickly they turn to borrowing. And borrowing um, can be a very effective method um, for raising finance. Uh, in the Second World War, I think the United States raised something like $185 billion just from the sale of, uh, of war bonds, mainly to the American general public. They were the people who were most buying them. So we're not talking trivial sums here, right? There's a, there's a lot of money in this. Um, but of course, borrowing uh, you know, has its limitations as well, right? Uh, you can only sell so many war bonds to people. And uh, war creates some particular circumstances that can make borrowing difficult, right? Um, you, know, you can become a bad, bad credit risk very easily if the war isn't going your way, um, or if the major centers of finance are geographically separated from you, or if they're on the other side of the war, right? Um, there are all kinds of different reasons why borrowing um, can become very difficult wartime, right? Um, and sometimes, um, you know, borrowing even continues long after uh, countries are, are really viable credit risks anymore, right? If you think about in the First World War, um, which essentially bankrupted Great Britain, um, in both world wars actually, the United States was a major lender um, to, all of its, uh, to all of its allies and really helped 
keep them going and keep them in, in both of those wars, right? Um, even though they really knew that there, there wasn't a way for their allies to pay them back after the war was over. Um, and that's one reason why um, very shortly, um, especially after the First World War, um, thoughts uh, began to shift very quickly toward a restitution that could be gained from the, um, from the opposing powers, right? Um, one of the more interesting anecdotes about uh, borrowing as a method of war finance that is, uh, I recently discovered, um, because it's the centenary of the First World War right now, there's a lot of new research going on about it, um, including some really fascinating stuff coming out of the Bank of England about how Great Britain financed its entry into the First World War. Um, and in particular, some of the, uh, the uh, researchers at the Bank of England have uh, covered this very interesting story um, about uh, a rather extraordinary deception that the British government and the Bank of England engaged in um, in order to keep uh, their initial war effort going. Um, so in 1914, um, as the sort of autumn and the winter begin to arrive, uh, people start to realize that this war is not going to be over in a couple of months like we thought. It's going to drag out. So the British government um, set out on this campaign. Um, to raise an extraordinary amount of money, right, through the sale of war bonds, uh, about 350 million pounds worth, right, um, in 1914 pounds, right, so an extraordinary amount of money. And the plan was for the British banks to pick up some of those bonds, sort of enough to get the ball rolling, and then the vast majority of the, the bond sales would be to the British general public. Right, um, and they assumed that, of course, you know, people are very, uh, you know, uh, nationalistic and patriotic. So, of course, they're going to pick up um, the tab for all of this. Um, but the plan ended up being uh, kind of a disaster, right? Because basically, nobody bought the war bonds. There was very little interest um, in this among the general public, and what interest there was tended to come from things like uh, groups like shipping companies who were suddenly booming because they were involved in the the war industries, right? Um, but the, the private interest that the, uh, the government had hoped to, uh, to provoke never really materialized, right? So they had this huge problem, right? They, would have been, they were sort of poised for disaster because if they hadn't been able to sell um, uh, all of these bonds um, uh, and you know, get the, the revenue from that, um, not only would it have hampered the war effort, uh, but it would have driven the, the prices of the outstanding bonds down because people would have seen there was no interest in them. Um, it would have made them more difficult to raise money in the future. Uh, and just in general, it would have been a PR disaster, right? Because then the Germans would have been able to say, look, England, you might as well just quit now. It's obvious that your heart's not in it. You, can't, you don't even want to finance the war. So just step out and you know, make a separate piece or something like that, right? So the government was poised for disaster, and, and thus also the war effort. And so what the Bank, the bank of England came up with this, uh, um, uh, with this scheme um, to, make it all, to make it all work. So what they did was they, um, they essentially took a massive amount of their own money, a couple hundred million pounds worth, and they advanced it to um, two or three of the executives of the Bank of England. right? And then those executives went out and bought all of the war bonds in their own names, right? as private individuals, right? um, and in their own names so that nobody would know that they were actually being effectively bought by the bank. right? Um, so they, they did this, and then the bank just held the, uh, the bonds on its own balance sheet right, as, um, as its assets, um, but they didn't put them under the usual category of government bonds, right? because again, people would have got wise. So they just put them over on some sort of like miscellaneous assets, um, you know, which suddenly increased by you know, like a couple of hundred uh, million pounds. Um, but nobody noticed, right? And then the British government was able to say, look, you know, look at the extraordinary success um, of this bond sale. Um, this is why, you know, like clearly everybody wants to be involved in this fight, right? So it ended up working out very well for them. Um, Keynes, who was uh, working in the Bank of England, and you won't be surprised to learn, was one of the people who was uh, sort of in the know about this. Um, he called this a, a masterly manipulation uh, of public policy and, and public opinion, right? Um, so anyway, I, I just I find that, uh, that story to be uh, quite interesting. Um, in any case, borrowing has its limitations. You can only do it for so long, right? So that gets us to the third um, factor in, uh, in war finance, which is inflation. And I will come back and talk about this more specifically because it's sort of a topic in its own right. Um, but again, as you can see, in peacetime as in wartime, inflation is very, a very easy choice for governments, right? It seems like it's costless. Um, yes, people are sort of aware that over the long term, you know, prices might rise and you might have some bad effects. But you know, for, um, uh, for politicians who are you know, ramping up a war effort, um, these concerns seem to be very, very distant, right? Um, it seems, you know, this is something that somebody years down the road, they can worry about that 
So governments very easily resort uh, to inflation, and there are many, many uh, cases of this. Uh, the, the famous one, I think, that's in all the money and banking textbooks, you know, the, the Continentals, right? Um, the, the paper money issued during uh, the American Revolution to try and finance that, right? It was very quickly inflated and, uh, and became worthless. And there are many more cases um, that you can point to throughout history. Um, so inflation, it seems like a really good idea at the time, um, but it has these um, uh, short and long-term effects that can actually end up being kind of disastrous. Um, in any case, none of these methods is really workable or is really a stable method for governments to finance a large-scale war over a large period of time, right? Um, they all have their limitations, and so in wartime, governments tend to be involved in this complicated dance where they're constantly trying to figure out which the, you know, what method they should lean on most right now, um, you know, uh, which is the less likely, uh, the least likely to, uh, to lead to a, a collapse of the war effort, because that is what happens um, if you try to, to lean on any one of these um, too much, right? Um, and so governments are constantly shifting back and forth between emphasis on different one method and usually using some form of them all at the same time. So um, once governments find, figure out a way to finance the war, um, once the war actually gets going, um, they need to mobilize, right? Um, suddenly, governments are in desperate need of a massive amount of physical and human resources that they can pour into the war effort, right? Um, you know, troops need to be outfitted, armies need to be put into the field, um, or what, you know, whatever uh, variation of that, uh, you know, technologically, you know, drone fleets need to be assembled or whatever people use these days. Um, defenses need to be strengthened, but the point is a massive infrastructure needs to be in place uh, for, a, for a war effort to really get off the ground, okay? And because of this, it's a, the whole process of war planning is this big logistical nightmare, right? And it is, uh, it's a problem that is very much subject to the socialist calculation uh, problem. Um, as you probably know or you've figured out, um, the economic calculation problem isn't just about socialism, right? It's about any kind of resource allocation that occurs without access to a system of market prices, right? And so it's very much a pro uh, uh, problem of ordinary public policy as well, including military operations, right? Um, for which there, you know, there aren't market, you know, true market prices um, for any of the goods that, that are involved in these sorts of military operations, right? Um, so uh, that's the sort of background of this. Um, but one of the distinctly Austrian ways that you can look at, uh, at the way that wars operate um, is by looking at, at uh, capital and by looking at the idea of the structure of production, right, that Austrians have been in so, in, so interested in, right? Um, this, uh, this sort of delicate interweaving of all these heterogeneous capital goods um, that make up the, the whole structure of the economy, right? Uh, you won't be surprised to learn that war has some pretty afound, uh, profound effects on the structure of production, um, and it distorts it, um, even in some cases destroys it um, in, in several different ways. Okay? So um, in general, you could say that war is a, basically a, a massive diversion of resources away from the paths that they would have taken in peacetime, right? I mean, that's sort of definitionally true um, of warfare. But you can look at its effect on the structure of production in a, at least a couple of different ways. Um, I'll call these uh, a horizontal way um, and a vertical way, right? So the first uh, effect is horizontal, and this is a shift between different stages of production, right? So as soon as war breaks out, um, suddenly um, government needs a massive amount of war goods, right? Um, you know, true, you know, guns and ammunition and tanks and you know the various other uh, uh, goods that are that go into making up a war, right? Um, so these need to be produced, but gen most economies aren't usually producing massive amounts of these goods. And that means the production has to be shifted, right? And it has to be shifted from ordinary consumer goods production into war industries, right? So this is a horizontal shift, right? Um, the, uh, uh, the capital, the labor um, that usually produce just ordinary consumer products and consumer services um, suddenly shift over, right? They, the uh, consumer production decreases or is totally eliminated, um, and everything gets pushed into war production, right? Um, again, you know, the, the sort of ordinary products of war, right? Guns and ammunition and the massive infrastructure and physical supplies and labor and so forth um, that militaries need to operate, right? Um, so this priority of war over consumer production, um, the immediate effect of it is that living standards are going to fall, right? There are going to be shortages of consumer goods um, and, you know, all those things that make up sort of quality of life, right? So living standards are immediately um, going to fall for people. 
Um, and this is going to happen over time as well, right? Because existing stocks of consumer goods will be shifted over uh, to military use, and the production of uh, future consumer goods is also going to decrease, right? So if you think about this in the case of the U.S. during World War II, um, you had a massive, massive decrease um, in the productions of all things consumer, right? Um, you know, a company like uh, GM, for instance, completely stopped the production of civilian cars during the Second World War and only produced military vehicles. Right? Um, it only took a few months after Pearl Harbor, actually, um, for like the entire civilian auto industry in the United States to essentially disappear and become just one massive war industry. Um, by the time, by the end of the war, there was one Chevy factory that was producing all replacement cars for all automobiles in the United States. Right, um, so that's one good. Uh, in 1942. Um, the sale, the sale of uh, vehicles to non-military personnel was actually outlawed completely, right? Um, and uh, and you know it became illegal to um, to uh, to store new cars outside, right? So you couldn't put the your existing stock of cars um, outside like an advertisement. You had to store them inside um, so that people wouldn't be buying them, right? Um, so it wouldn't be you know uh, invoking too much consumer demand, right? Um, so this is uh, the the first very important effect. Um, that war has on the, on the structure of production. This very simple switch uh, from, con uh, for, for, from producing for consumers to producing for the war effort, right? Um, and this one's a little uh, simpler to see. But there's a more difficult, um, uh, more sort of complicated, uh, unseen, to use Bastiat's word, um, effect on the structure of production as well. And this is when production shifts from uh, what we call the higher stages of production to the lower stages, right? Um, so if you think about uh, um, uh, Menger's um, model of the structure of production, where you have the, the lower stages, which are, produ which are like uh, producing um, uh, small-scale capital goods and consumer goods, and then you have the higher stages, which are the really advanced capital goods and factors of production. Um, the outbreak of war is going to tend to shift the structure of production down toward those lower stages. Right? Um, again, the, the reason for this is that war requires resources right now. Right? Uh, Mises has a great line where he says, uh, war can't be waged with future goods. Right? It has to be waged with present goods. Right? So you, you need the guns and the ammunition and the tanks and the planes and all of this. You need it right now, right? Because it's not going to do you any good in the future, right? So um, because of this, um, the entire economy becomes more sort of present-oriented, right? And you have these very high stages capital goods and the higher stages of production, um, goods that are producing, you know, uh, uh, complex mining equipment and, you know, very advanced plants and factories, um, very, uh, very specialized goods. Um, these aren't useful for the war effort, right? They can't be converted into, you know, assembly lines uh, for ammunition and small arms and things like that. So they're either abandoned or they're simply just not replaced uh, when eventually they, they wear out, right? They don't support the war effort, um, so they're, they're given a lot less focus. Right? Um, instead, in those lower stages, every capital good that can be converted to, the, to war production is, right? Because you're going to have, in the lower stages especially, um, goods that are a little bit more convertible, right? So you have the car factories and the aircraft factories that simply switch from civilian to military production, right? There's a cost associated with that, um, but it's smaller, right? And, it, and the conversion can be done. Right? So everyone is, starts shifting um, towards these, these lower stages because that's where the resources are that are needed to keep the military effort going. Right? The punchline of all this uh, is capital consumption, right? So hopefully throughout this week, you've already learned a little bit about um, how delicate the structure of production is and just how vital it is that human beings build capital and build a consistent, coordinated structure of production over time. That is the basis of prosperity, right? That, that is the explanation um, of, of how essentially development can happen and living standards can rise. So when you play with that, and when you physically destroy it through the destruction of war, um, and also destroy it economically um, by destroying the incentives for entrepreneurs to save and invest and build capital, um, and giving you know, a certain group of privileged producers um, the incentive to, uh, to just massively increase their business by bidding for war contracts and things like that, um, the result is that the capital that ordinary people need uh, in order to maintain their living standards, this is going to be consumed, um, their living standards are going to fall, right? Um, so it produces a war mobilization, produces
kind of crisis in the economy, if you will, um, that's not all that different um, from what you might see, for instance, in a business cycle. Right? Um, this is a different kind of uh, example I wanted to give. Um, does anybody know who this is? No? Uh, it's Wilfred Owen. Um, Wilf well, it says it at the bottom, I guess, so. <laughs> Stupid question, huh? Uh, Owen is one of the, probably the most famous of the English war poets um, of the First World War. Um, and uh, he has a very nice example. Um, I take this from one of the, the stanzas of one of his poems um, when he talks about uh, che the promise of uh, cheap homes for everybody um, that we're going to get after the war is over, um, but we can't build those right now. What we, don't, we don't need homes. We need aerodromes right now. Um, and this is, he's actually, uh, without knowing it, um, talking about exactly this structure of production issue, right? The entire change of the economy to a war footing, right? The elimination of consumer goods, consumer consumer durables, the shift of capital um, to produce these resources that are really only good um, for the war effort. So I happen to like this, uh, this quite a bit. Um, again, here's another uh, more ancient uh, example of the, the same type of thing. Punchline is that no country has ever profited from protracted warfare, right? So we've known this for millennia now. Um, we just needed modern economics to come along and, uh, and tell us uh, why warfare is actually really a good thing. You just didn't realize it uh, this whole time, right? Okay. Um, in any case, um, so if, if the economic outlook of war is so bad, right, if it does produce a kind of crisis, um, you know, how is it possible that wars ever happen, let alone are carried on over a long period of time? How is it possible that anybody could, uh, could stand for this, right? Um, and the answer uh, tends to focus on uh, monetary inflation. Right. Um, I mentioned that I would come back to this um, before um, because it really is a sort of a topic in its own right. Um, inflation is a, a time-tested method um, for not only continuing and, and supplying a war effort, um, but also for concealing its true costs from consumers. And this is the, the key element, right? Because people don't stand for this. As I said, you know, no matter what uh, you know, your nominal ideology might be, once you have to start paying the human and the monetary cost of a war, people's support for it tends to decrease quite quickly, right? So one effective way that you can conceal the costs of war um, is through various forms of monetary expansion, right? And in fact, if you uh, expand the money supply, as countries very often do, right from the beginning of wars, um, you can not only uh, pre uh, preserve uh, the, uh, the illusion of prosperity, but you can actually make it seem as if the country is booming, right? This is one of the great myths, uh, you know, the myth of wartime prosperity. It's especially prevalent about the U.S. during World War II. Um, this is something, again, I'll reference Bob Higgs' work, um, because he is the, the, the single economist who has the most to just completely demolish this myth um, that the U.S. was really prosperous uh, because of its entry into World War II and that World War II got America out of the Depression and things like that. Um, so it's, it's simply not true. Um, but uh, monetary expansion is one reason um, why uh, people have these wrong ideas about uh, supposed wartime prosperity, right? Um, I'll say also historically, um, one of the very first things governments do when war is declared is go off the gold standard, right? In the First World War, all the major belligerents did this immediately um, upon the outbreak of the war um, because they realized that, you know, without, um, if you're in the presence of, say, a gold standard or some other limit on the, the money monopoly, um, without that limit, uh, or with that limit in place, it's very, very difficult um, to expand the money supply um, to the extents that governments need in order to finance their wars, right? So uh, gold standard uh, or monetary checks um, tend to be abolished right away um, as soon as the war uh, breaks out. Um, and then there are a couple of other ways um, that, uh, that this monetary expansion has deleterious effects on the economy. Um, the first, of course, is that they increase uh, nominal prices and wages in the war goods industries, they tend to be the first receivers of new money. So they benefit um, from this simply because they have new demand for their products, right? Um, so the merchants of death do really well from you know, the outbreak of war. Uh, but there's also um, the, the more subtle um, Austrian flavored part of the monetary expansion, and that is the Cantillon effects, right? Um, because the issuing of new money also creates wealth redistribution, right? Um, in this case, it's to the war goods industries, right? You know, the, 
uh, the Lockheed Martins uh, and so on of the world, um, and away from essentially the uh, consumers in the economy, right? Uh, people in other industries. And the further away your business is from the war industries, uh, the worse the wealth redistribution is going to be for you, right? However, from an, uh, uh, an aggregate perspective, it can look like the economy is actually booming, right? Because many prices uh, are, are rising. Um, you know, businesses are going, to, especially in the war goods industries, they're going to be expanding, looking very, very prosperous. Um, and uh, as a general inflationary effect, um, even um, while the the Cantillon effects process is working out, there are still going to be price rises in other areas of the economy as well. Um, the stock market very often booms um, in response to um, you know these huge. Um, uh, war goods orders and things like that. Um, so again, it can all look on the surface um, like it's uh, really good, but what's going on beneath the surface um, is of course there was just a monetary expansion, right? The, the real resources in the economy haven't changed, and in fact they're actively being destroyed, right? As the capital structure is being eroded and being shifted into production of war goods that don't actually help consumers. Consumer goods themselves are being destroyed um, and their production is being severely curtailed and so on. So what's really going on is that real incomes, standards of living and so on are, uh, are falling. Um, but the, the nominal picture, the superficial picture of the economy is that it's actually doing pretty well. Right? Uh, and this, by the way, is just one more reason why it's so vital um, to talk about all of the costs of war, right? Because at this point, I think people are pretty familiar with the human costs of war, right? We know about the loss of life and the loss of welfare from the direct destruction. Um, but what we don't see, again, it's, it's Bastiat's unseen, um, are some of these uh, less obvious economic implications um, of, of how the, these wars are carried on. Right? Uh, once more, here's Mises. Um, one can say without exaggeration that inflation is an indispensable means of militarism. Without it, the repercussions of war on welfare become obvious much more quickly and penetratingly. War weariness would set in much earlier. Hmm. Okay. Um, however, um, the negative effects of war on the economy don't just stop um, with some of these core issues. Um, there's the broader implications as well, right? A again, as I was saying, Mises was always stressing this fundamental choice that governments make, right? Um, is it protectionism? Is it economic nationalism and so forth? Or are you going to pursue a policy of laissez-faire, right? Um, and inevitably, um, if you choose uh, the protectionist policy, policies of price controls, wartime controls over the economy, it sets in motion this other economic logic um, that Mises also analyzed, whereby government controls tend to accumulate um, over time. So if you know Mises' short essay, uh, The Middle of the Road Policy Leads to Socialism, uh, one of the examples that he gives in this essay uh, are wartime economies, right? Um, which start out um, by trying to control just a few prices here um, or a few businesses there just to support the war effort. But then they rapidly run into shortages and all kinds of other economic problems. And so governments are faced with this constant choice, right? Um, do we try to, um, do we just take a step back, uh, abolish the controls and move back toward freer markets? Or do we add controls to try and mitigate the effects of the first controls that we put on, right? And uh, unfortunately, um, you'll be shocked to learn, um, governments tend to want to add on price controls, right? So. Uh, Control over the economy has this sort of cumulative effect whereby over the course of the war, the problems get worse and worse, so governments are constantly struggling to find new controls, new regulations, new prohibitions that they can put on consumer goods and on consumer-oriented production in order to support the war effort. And the result, uh, what you get, is um, what's sometimes called war socialism, right? Uh, the wartime, uh, the, uh, the true war economy, um, whereby all production um, essentially, is, is, is you have a, a de facto system of central planning that exists, um, with all production being directed toward the war effort. Right. So this is actually what happened in all the major belligerent countries in both of the world wars. Right. Um, even the ones that started out relatively free ended up with extensive systems um, of central planning by the time the conflict, uh, the conflicts came to an end. Okay. Um, What's interesting about war socialism is that usually the, uh, the system of, of private property, free exchange, free contracting, and so forth that existed in this country, these countries before the war, nominally all of that stays in place. Right? Um, there isn't a revolution, you know, there isn't a, you know, a new constitution written um, and a, a new era.
declared. Um, instead, this happens small, it happens like a piecemeal, right? A little bit over time, um, it's cumulative, and typically, even by the end, even though by the end of the war, there's a de facto uh, uh, centralized control over the economy. Nominally, all of these property rights and, and private enterprise and so forth tend to remain in place, right? Um, and this is um, uh, what Mises called um, socialism of the German pattern, right? Um, de facto socialism, but with a sort of a nominal um, adherence to, uh, to, to free markets, right? Um, I also mentioned the ratchet effect. Um, again, this is something that Bob Higgs has written quite a bit about, um, about this um, cumulative process um, of uh, the buildup of, of government power and government control over the economy. The idea is that, like a ratchet, um, wartime uh, provides, gives governments a great excuse um, to increase its control over the economy, and so governments take on massive war planning powers and so forth. After the conflict is over, some of those powers get returned, right, and, and are abolished, uh, but not all of them. There's always something that remains. So over time, um, government's control over the economy tends to, to, uh, to increase, right? It has these huge upsurges, and then it goes back down, but not quite to where it was before, and then it goes up again and so forth. So the general trend over time um, is for government to become more and more involved um, in the economy. Right? Um, again, Mises just puts it best, um, in the long run, war and the preservation of the market economy are, are incompatible, right? There is no way to preserve for any significant period of time the, these two demands, right? The, on the one hand, consumers for high standards of living, and on the other hand, governments um, for, the, for, for war production, um, for the military effort. Okay, so um, if we can say something a little bit about how wars, uh, how they start, uh, how they're prosecuted and so forth, um, what can we say about the end of war and you know, what we could possibly do to sort of prevent wars in the future, right? So if we think back to one of the first things I said, which is the idea of uh, purpose behind a war, right? Mises is, uh, put it pretty plainly, I think. Um, he said, look, if war is purposeful, um, we know that there are war makers out there, right? Um, if we want to stop war, what we really need to do is eliminate the conditions that make war possible, right? We need to eliminate those motivations and those purposes that the war makers have. If we can do that, um, then we can, um, you know, then we have a, a serious chance um, at, uh, at peace um, in the long run. And for Mises, again, it's about ideology, it's about institutions, it's about embracing liberalism, you know, the, the time-honored principles of you know, laissez-faire and laissez-passe that allow for global peace, global economic cooperation, right? That's the key um, behind this, uh, this entire thing. Um, and as you said, the main thing to do is to discard the ide ideology that generates war, right? Ideologies of conflict, right? Whether it's classical uh, Marxist class analysis um, or nationalist ideologies, racist ideologies, all of these different types um, of, of uh, uh, ideological views that, have, that hold conflict um, to be at the center um, of their analysis, right? Inevitable conflicts between human groups. The only thing we can do to prevent war, really, in the long run, um, is to discard these ideologies and embrace a more thoroughgoing liberalism and a, more, a philosophy uh, of peace and of social cooperation and hopefully of prosperity, um, because prosperity um, is the last thing that war ever actually creates. Um, so uh, I think I'm out of time, so thank you for your attention.